Hi there. You're here to watch a presentation about designing effective surveys. I'm Joe Anderson, the Research Director at Phonolytics, and this presentation was funded by generous support from the Centre for Effective Altruism. There's a lot to cover under this topic, so please, if you don't want to watch the entire presentation from start to finish, that's fine. You can use the links in the description to check out the parts that are the most relevant to you. You can also pause at different points if you want to think about an example yourself before I get into the explanation of the recommendations that I make. That's a lot more helpful for a lot of people when they're trying to learn. So to start off, it's important to think about multiple perspectives when you're designing a survey. And by that, I mean, bear three people in mind. One of those people is the obvious one, yourself as the question asker with the things that you have in mind that you wanna know from the people you're surveying. The second is the participant, the perspective of the person who's taking your survey, what they wanna get out of it, what they're hoping to avoid. And finally, you need to remember that down the road, you yourself or someone else are going to need to interpret the results of the survey that you've run. So it's important to think about the questions that you write in terms of how you're going to interpret those results later. Oftentimes the needs of these three different people, so to speak, will be in opposition. And so you have to find a way of balancing them. You as the question asker want to ask everything under the sun. The participant wants to answer as little as possible because they have time constraints, they're busy. And you as the results interpreter need to do both. You want to get a lot of information, but you also want to have it in an understandable, easy to interpret way. So let's start off with how you prepare your survey. First, I always recommend that people start by clearly defining and operationalizing their research question. And I'll get into what that means. But first, let's talk about what happens when you don't go through this process. So if you don't define a research question, it can cause you to miss a key question, just not thinking of it at all. It can cause you to measure a key question but accidentally include it in a way that makes analysis or interpretation of that of those results difficult. Or what I see the most often is if you don't have a really clear key question in mind, you can end up throwing in a whole bunch of questions that are related to your topic, but aren't necessarily central. And there's various reasons why that's problematic, but the main one is length. Your survey will be very long if you take this approach. So let's get into an example. And I should say all the examples in this presentation are made up hypothetical examples, um, often referring to events that haven't really happened. Uh, so just bear that in mind. All right, let's say that instead of defining specific research questions, you have general survey goals. This is often good practice um, and is a good starting point, but I would generally suggest research questions instead, as we'll see. So general survey goals might look something like this. You want to understand whether an event was worth doing and you want to understand how you could improve it for the next time. So with these goals in mind, you might write a survey that looks kind of like this. It looks pretty good at a glance. You've got questions about satisfaction with various aspects of the event, questions about networking, whether attendees questions were answered, whether they would recommend it, and whether it was useful, if they have any suggestions for improvement. All things that definitely relate to the survey goals, but there are a few issues with this. Have we missed a key question here? I can't actually really tell because I'm not sure what the key questions were. And on top of that, how are we going to interpret the results in order to understand whether the event was worth doing? We haven't decided based on all of these many questions, which ones are most important and what kind of answer to those questions would suggest that yes, we should do the event again versus no, we should not. It would be helpful to know if we get X percent who say that they would uh, recommend this event to someone else that we will do it again. And if we get lower than that percent, then we won't. Having that cutoff point or general idea at least of what you'll do with those results is really helpful ahead of time. And finally, the last issue with a survey like this is just that it's time consuming. That's a participant perspective. That something like this, while great source of information for you as the question asker, uh, 
is going to take a long time for a participant to get through and some of the questions might seem less relevant or meaningful to them. So they may be more likely to drop out. All right, so that's an example of what happens when you don't do this. But what should you do? Well, we should start out by defining your research question, by which I mean clearly and briefly describe the main thing or things that you want to know. And I always say have a maximum of three of these. I know you probably have a lot of questions that you want to ask, but it's important to prioritize so that when you come to writing the actual survey questions, you can also prioritize those the same way. It doesn't mean you can't include anything else, but you want to know what is most important for you. What do you need to know as opposed to wanting to know? And I also suggest that you write down some possible answers to your research question. We can think of these as an informal version of scientific hypotheses and alternative hypotheses. So you have a question in mind and it could come out one way, but also make sure that you think about other ways that it could come out. Then we get to operationalizing your research question, which means trying to answer the question that you had in that general sense with a concrete measure in your survey. So turning the general idea into the actual wording of a question that you ask participants. And part of this, just as we thought about possible answers to your research question, we need to think about different outcomes on the survey question, the operationalized version. So which specific outcomes on the survey indicate an answer of this versus that when it comes to your higher level research question? And finally, just a reminder that if you need to compare groups in order to answer your research question, for instance, your, your, one of your key questions is whether there's a difference between people who are under or over 35, make sure that you include a question that lets you actually determine which of those groups they're in. All right, let's turn to an example again. So if we follow the defining and operationalizing process, let's take those objectives that we had in the past example and turn them into research questions instead. If you want to, you can pause the video here and take a moment to try and think about how you would do that yourself. First, I always suggest that you try to interrogate your objectives, really dig into them. What does worth doing in that first objective really mean? What does improvement mean? And think about what you really want to get at when you're asking whether the event was worth doing. Really get into how you will know whether that event is worth doing, kind of on, a, on an intuitive level at first, and then take that intuition and turn it into a more specific research question. So let's see what I mean by that. Was the event considered useful by most attendees? What about by non-attendees? That's one way that you could take it as worth doing. If most of the people who attended thought that it was useful, then to you, maybe that means it was worth doing. How about another way? Was this event more or less useful than other events that you have run as a group and theoretically could run again? Uh, did it meaningfully change an attendees understanding of a topic? Um, those are all different ways that you could think about an event being worth doing. And they're more specific than the general objectives that we had before, so they will be more useful for turning into actual survey questions. And are there ways that we could make this more useful for attendees the next time? Are there ways we could increase attendance, especially for underrepresented segments of the group we're targeting next time? Um, those are other ways of framing the second objective of understanding how we could improve on the event next time. Again, more specific and therefore easier to turn into operationalized concrete survey questions. Survey length. This is a tricky one. Everyone wants to ask all the questions that they have in mind. And typically when we dive into research, we have a lot of questions in mind. This is what leads me to say most survey drafts in my experience, including my own, are too long. What you want to do when you're trying to figure out what the length is, because often just knowing how long something is, is difficult in and of itself, what you want to do is have someone who's unfamiliar with the content take that survey for you and tell you how long it took them. Ideally, you might have more than one person do this, but 
under the constraints of reality and resources, you might only have one. And that's okay if so. Just make sure that it's someone who hasn't seen this content before, because when you're already familiar with it, even if you're trying to go slowly, it's kind of a false process of slowing yourself down as opposed to the, the reality of reading something and trying to comprehend it for the first time. My overall recommendations when it comes to survey length are to keep your survey as short as possible. And that goes double for if your participants are not being paid or compensated for their time in any way. You're relying on their goodwill. So you need to repay that goodwill by doing everything you can to make this a pleasant and non-onerous experience for your participants. The bottom line here is if you only need, 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 need one question, only ask one question. That's incredibly hard to do as a researcher, as a person who's designing a survey and putting all this time into it. But if you only need and only ask one question, you're a lot more likely to get a lot of responses than if you ask that one question plus a bunch of other questions that might be nice to have. And because people often ask for specific guidelines about how long a survey should be, I've come up with some very broad tentative ideas of how long that should be. So for most program evaluation type work where you want to know, did they like an event? Uh, did they have a good experience with a particular campaign? Uh, was this thing impactful? You generally want to keep that very short, under five minutes and preferably one to two minutes if that's feasible for you. This isn't the kind of survey that people really get a lot of inherent enjoyment out of most of the time. So keeping it as short as possible means that more people are likely to actually do it. And similarly, an unpaid attitude or behavior survey, asking attitudes toward farmed animals, uh, things that you've done recently, shopping wise, uh, that kind of thing when it's not paid and doesn't have a lottery incentive or anything like that. Again, you need to keep it as short as you can, preferably under five minutes and even more preferably down to one or two minutes if that's feasible for you. Finally, it's kind of a different ballpark if you're talking about paying participants, either individually uh, so that they get a dollar or two maybe for doing your survey, or if you have a lottery incentive where they're entered into a drawing for a chance to win a $100 gift card, for example. Under those circumstances, you can generally ask a little more time of people, ideally not more than 10 or 15 minutes, because even still you're dealing with boredom and people just losing interest, going too fast, that kind of issue. But you can ask uh, up to 25 to 30 minutes of them at the very most. I do recommend against that if you can avoid it, but I've been there. You have a lot of questions you want to ask. Next up, let's talk about sampling. Where do you get your participants from? Surveys are usually completed by a sample of your population of interest. So the first thing that you need to do is decide what your population of interest actually is in order to help you when it comes to distributing your survey to those people. So for instance, it might be people who are subscribed to your email list as an organization, but even if that's the case, you need to decide a little more specifically, are you thinking about all subscribers, including people who might have signed up but never actually opened an email? Or are you thinking of more invested people, ones who have been on the list longer than a certain amount of time, for instance? You can often include early questions in your survey as screeners. For instance, how long have you been on our email list? And then use that to establish your criteria. So if you want people who have only been on your list for at least six months, then when they answer that question, if it is lower than six months, you can have the survey automatically remove them, say thank you for your time, but unfortunately we're only looking for people who have been on our list for at least six months. And the reason I suggest doing this rather than just putting it in the invitation letter, which you should also do, is that it's pretty common for people to skim those letters or not read them at all and just click straight through to your survey and start taking it if they're going to take it at all. And then you might get people who are not eligible according to the criteria that you have. It's also preferable to know if you can the size of your population so that you have a sense of the response rate you got. So you want to know that there are 600 people on your mailing list so that when you get 25 completes, you have a sense of whether that's very good it's not, or pretty bad, 
it's also really useful to know the basic characteristics, especially demographics of your population. So if you have any way of getting that kind of information about your complete sample, sorry, your complete population, your mailing list, for instance, um, that's really useful to have. So for instance, maybe when they signed up, they gave you a few pieces of information that you therefore have on everybody on the list. That's really helpful later for understanding how representative your sample is. And finally, people often, very often ask me about sample sizes. How many people is enough people? And unfortunately, the answer is that it depends. Uh, you can use a sample size calculator linked in the slide to calculate how many people you need if you're looking for a survey that is representative of a particular population. Or you can do a power analysis if what you're looking for is a significant difference between two groups, like people over or under 35. Um, but there is no hard and fast rule for how many people is enough. It depends on a lot of things. And if you're having difficulty with the sample size calculator or the power analysis, please feel free to visit Phonolytics Office Hour. We can help you walk through some of those determinations. All right, let's turn next to attrition and non-response. First, I need to define what these are. So attrition refers to a partial survey response, someone who completes some of your survey questions but drops out partway through. Non-response, on the other hand, means not starting the survey at all, as you probably guessed. Uh, so a low response rate, like that 25 out of 600 people on your mailing list, means that there was a lot of non-response. Oftentimes, when people are doing surveys, they will ignore non-response or partial response because either they think that it's not a big deal, or they think it might be a big deal, but there's nothing I can do about it. Neither of those things is actually true, so it's important to think about. First, random non-response is not that bad, but differential non-response, when different people drop out versus don't or respond versus don't, um, is quite bad and it's common. So it can have pretty big implications for interpreting your results if that's happened to you. We'll talk more about those things a little bit later, but for now, what you want to do is prevent this from happening in the first place. Design your invitation and your consent form to keep non-response as low as you can and keep your survey short, sweet, easy to understand in order to minimize people dropping out partway through attrition. And you can also measure basic population characteristics if possible, uh, like during event sign up, during mailing list sign up, um, just getting a couple of really basic pieces of information about everyone so that you have an understanding of who then doesn't complete your survey later. So prevention is ideal, but if you can't do prevention and you're at the reaction phase where your data is already collected, there is still something you can do. If you have any kind of basic demographic breakdown of your population, uh, gender, age, first time attending an event, for instance, um, then you're in pretty good position. And if you don't have specific population numbers like that, like the examples on the screen, but you do have something a little squishier, uh, a show of hands, just your personal observation at the event, that's still better than nothing. That's still something you can use. So I'm gonna talk about both of these things at the same time. In either case, whether it's specific numbers based on sign up or it's observation, something a little bit more anecdotal, what you want to do is come up with the best estimate you can for how your demographics break down in your population and compare that against the breakdown of those same demographics in your survey completers. So what does it mean for your interpretation if, for instance, you have 70% uh, males in your entire population, but then when you look at the survey, you have only 25% male? Obviously, men were less likely to complete the survey for some reason, and that's going to affect your interpretation of the results. So in reference to that second type, where your numbers are not specific, but based on more anecdotal evidence, that is fine to use. Just make sure that if you are doing that, that you are reporting where those estimates came from, how you got them, and whatever subjectivity went into it. So just be clear always in your reporting about where your numbers come from. <clears throat> 
And finally, if you know nothing about the population, um, you have no numbers, no observation at all, uh, just do your best to describe how any plausible differences between your sample and population would affect your interpretation of the results. So for instance, with pretty much any survey, it's safe to assume that people who are less interested in the topic are probably less likely to have responded. In other words, the people who did respond are probably the ones who are the most engaged, or in some cases, uh, the people who have the strongest opinion, whether it's positive or negative. And so that tells you something about how you should interpret the results and if you should make some kind of mental adjustment, um, like assuming that people who are less engaged and didn't respond might be a little closer to the neutral point on some of the responses that you got. You can also consider the worst case scenario. So if you know that you had a large amount of non-response and you imagine that every person who didn't respond to your survey had responded in the worst possible way, so not at all satisfied with your event, for instance, how would your overall results look? That's probably not would have, what would have actually happened if those people had taken the survey, but it gives you kind of a bottom line of worst case scenario, like I said. Um, if they had participated and it went as badly as possible, here's how things would look. This is more of a reference slide as indicated by the little icon in the top left, but these are some causes of attrition and non-response. So I'm just gonna put them up on the screen and let you go over this on your own time. You might want to pause the video once we go a little further. Again, the best solution is to keep attrition and non-response as low as you can. So consider all of these causes of non-response and the solutions, keeping your survey short having informed consent at the beginning so that people know what they're getting into, using reminders, come complete our survey, you haven't done it yet, and having an incentive for them if you can. And also consider these causes of attrition when people drop out partway through a survey. There's a lot of potential issues with surveys. I'm sure you've experienced them yourself with other people's. Um, so do your best to avoid those by keeping it short, reviewing for problematic questions, annoying formatting issues, and just keep an eye on the other surveys that you're completing, whether it's one from your grocery store or your cell phone provider. Everyone's sending surveys all the time and just keep an eye out for what annoys you. Make sure that you don't do it to other people. Next, another reference slide, talking a bit more detail about those types of attrition and non-response that I mentioned earlier. Random non-response, again, this isn't that problematic and this is what you're assuming if you just ignore response rate, you are assuming essentially that the people who didn't complete your survey were just a random subset of your population. Um, if that's the case, then you don't have any problem. The issue is that that isn't necessarily the case. And it's quite common for differential attrition to occur where some people are more likely to take your survey than others. Like we talked about people who are more engaged or motivated are more likely to do so a lot of the time. But also you can see um, people from less privileged groups, for, for instance, being less likely to take your survey as they might have less time or less reason to believe that anything will change if they do complete your survey. So it's really important to bear in mind that this might be the case, especially if you're in this third camp of having unknown attrition and non-response. If you don't have even a rough idea of what your population demographics are, you won't know which of the above types of attrition or non-response you have. And it's best to assume that you probably have at least some differential attrition. Ethical considerations probably aren't what you're watching this slideshow for, but as a researcher conducting any kind of research that involves uh, animal participants, whether human or non-human, it's really important to remember the principles of ethics that should guide all of your research. So I will let you dig into these links further, and I hope that you will, but in a very quick nutshell, the main considerations are respecting the people who are taking your survey, being concerned for their welfare and keeping it in mind at all times, and treating people fairly and equitably. Phonolytics has a more in-depth research ethics and data handling policy that you can take a look at by following the link on the slide if you want an example of how this can be done. But we also suggest that you take this two hour online course, perhaps as part of your professional development, uh, that 
teaches you a bit about how to treat participants, human participants ethically. Going a little further, if you're going to have a survey, it's important to have a consent form at the beginning, not just so that you can be ethical, although that is the focus of this slide, but bear in mind if you're you're thinking this doesn't apply to me, I don't need to do it, bear in mind that it's also likely to increase your response rate because by having a good consent form, just a short one, you're telling people what to expect and they know that they're not getting into an incredibly long, incredibly boring survey because hopefully you've already conveyed to me conveyed to them that that is not the case. So these are the elements of a good consent form and I will now turn to an example. This is a consent form that you might use for program evaluation. Um, and as it says here, like I just mentioned, a good consent form can also increase your response rate. So this is a consent form uh, for an imaginary survey about this survey design presentation. As you can see, uh, down the right hand side of the slide, it lists the purpose of each sentence in this consent form. And you can see that it doesn't have to be very long to convey a lot of information. So first you want to tell participants, why them? Why are they getting this invitation? So you're invited to complete the survey because you watched Phonolytics survey design presentation. It's important to tell them that their participation is voluntary, even if that seems like it should be obvious. And it's also really important to tell them the purpose of the survey, why you're doing this, uh, especially if you're not giving them anything for it, understanding that it's going to be used for something important to them uh, is much more likely to make them participate than not. And finally, in that first paragraph, we have the estimated length of the survey. Again, keep it short and put this here. Even if it is longer, do your best to estimate accurately. Uh, because it's not only ethical to give people a good idea of what they're getting into, but it also lets them set aside enough time to do your survey at a time when they aren't going to have to drop out partway through. Then you definitely want to include something about the confidentiality and the use of the data that you're collecting so that people understand when they're giving you their responses what you're going to do with it. And finally, you don't need to ask them to sign anything if you're doing an online survey. You can just have implied consent where you say that you're indicating that you consent to participate by clicking through to complete the survey. All right, now let's get into the details of designing the survey itself. There's a lot here. I'm not going to go over all of it in depth, so please feel free to pause at any point and just read what's on the slides or to look at the slide deck itself, which we'll also be including for your reference. There's a lot of guidelines for question wording, but for the most part, they come down to keeping the questions so short, simple, and easy for everyone to read. You also want to bear in mind who you're targeting. You don't want to think about the average member of your population. You definitely don't want to be thinking about the most motivated star member of your population. You want to think about somebody who's actually pretty low on a lot of different things. You want the, to think of someone who maybe doesn't have a lot of time to focus on the survey, uh, like the person in the example photo who might be distracted. Uh, someone who's low on reading ability, low on motivation to do a good job and low on conscientiousness. If this seems a little weird because you would rather have the opinions of people who are focused and motivated, I get that. But bear in mind that if you're trying to understand an entire population, you need your survey to be accessible to that entire population. And that means thinking about the people who are lowest on these scores. And always have someone else review and test your survey to make sure that it's clear to someone who isn't you. I can't stress enough the number of times that I have thought something was perfectly fine and then somebody else tested it and found something that I had missed. Here's a checklist that could be useful to you if you're looking for issues in your question wording. Double-barreled questions refer to questions where it looks like one question, but really if you think about it and pull it apart, it's two questions hidden in one. Did you enjoy this presentation and find it useful? It's one question, sort of, but really it's two. And you should pull those apart and put them separately because if people agree with one part of it, but not the other, then they're not gonna have any real way of answering the question. 
Next, also think about whether a question is leading. For instance, was this presentation good? While that might seem pretty straightforward and short, and it is, uh, it's also leading in the sense that it's not considering other options that the person might have in mind. And it's sort of implying that good is the right answer. Whereas if you just say, was this presentation good or bad? And then have a range of options as answers, it's giving equal weight to all of them. Next, look out for a lot of negatives in your questions. Specifically, I watch out for small negation words, like, like physically small short words, like not or don't, because if someone's completing your survey quickly and skimming, it can be really easy to miss those small words. If you put them up at the front of your sentence, that's helpful because people tend to pay a little bit more attention when they're first starting. And then once they think they know what they're reading, they might get a little blase about the rest. Um, but avoid having those small words if you can, or make them bold or capital, something to make them stand out. Also, definitely avoid multiple negations. Never ever have multiple negations in one sentence if you can avoid it. And that includes not just a double negative that we tend to avoid in English, but also uh, things like, I dislike people who avoid eating meat. There aren't any negations in there technically, but there's two negative words and it can get a little confusing when you have multiple negative words in one sentence. As I've said before, keep it straightforward and specific as much as you possibly can. And think about, not that this is your actual audience, but it's a good rule of thumb to remember to think, would a 13 year old or would a non-native speaker of my language be able to answer this question? And finally, if you're using a number of questions to get at a single concept, like different ways of asking for attitudes about animals, for instance, try to have roughly equal numbers of positively framed and negatively framed questions. So ones that, that ask about your, whether you like animals, but then also ones about whether you think that uh, humans are better than animals, for instance, a bit more of a negative frame. All right, turning to an example again. Let's look at some questions that are for measuring opinions about an event. So here we have three general types of question. The first one is asking about the value of the sessions at this hypothetical workshop by Phonolytics. The second one is a series of questions, agreement to disagreement, uh, about the environment of the workshop. And then the third is about people who decided not to sign up for a follow-up session. So this would presumably just be seen by people who said that they had decided not to follow up. Let's look at some improvements. If you like, you can pause the video here and think about what improvements you might make to these questions based on what we've talked about so far, and then continue when you're ready. Okay, now let's look at some possible ways of improving those questions we just saw. First, whereas before it was asked in the way that people were supposed to provide a percentage of sessions they thought were valuable, now this is a Likert scale, as we call it. So more of a general opinion from not at all valuable to extremely valuable. And in a way this feels less objective because a percentage is just a number, whereas this is something a little squishier, an opinion, not at all valuable, extremely valuable. But the issue with the percentages is that people don't necessarily think that closely about the number of sessions that they saw, the number they thought were valuable in order to become, be able to come up with a percentage that's really accurate or meaningful. So probably in this kind of case where opinions are what you're looking for, having something that's a little easier to interpret in terms of the responses people give is likely better. Then for the next section here, we just did some tweaking of the wording that we had. So if we look back at before, all of the sentences start with that same stem, the phonolytics capacity building workshop, which is quite long and pretty repetitive. So if you just look at those questions as they're written right here, you can glaze over a little bit and it's harder to read the later part of the sentence, which is the important part and the part that differs. So instead, here I have flipped things around a little bit in each question to highlight the focus of the sentence. Uh, 
in the first one, it's about feeling welcome. So I put that up at the beginning. For the second and third, it's about the people at the workshop. So I say people first, and then kept the rest of the sentence a little shorter and a little clearer. And I think the structure helps to emphasize the points that are important when you want people to read it. And finally, whereas we had before, why did you decide not to sign up for a follow-up session? I would probably suggest changing this to something that doesn't imply that it was a decision that they made, because not all of the responses are about a thought out decision. Some of them are a little more incidental. Um, so instead of why didn't, why did you decide not to, it's why didn't you sign up? This also puts that negative closer to the beginning of the sentence, which like I mentioned before is useful. And finally, I said, select the biggest reason to make sure that they understand that they're only meant to select one of these and it should be the most important. Then you'll see that in the items themselves that they can choose from, the third item I found a little ambiguous. It said, I didn't have time. Does that mean that they didn't have time to do the sign up process or they didn't have time for the actual session itself? So to make this clearer, you could change it to, I didn't have time to meet, or if it's the sign up you care about, I didn't have time to sign up. Finally, the last option just said other before, and usually, unless you really aren't that interested in other responses, um, it's helpful to say please specify and to have a text box where they can let you know what the other reason was. So I should say, all of these are just suggestions and pretty subjective. So if you didn't come up with these uh, ways of tweaking the questions, don't think that it means that you did it wrong. All of these are my opinion on ways that it might make it a little clearer and easier for participants, but they're by no means the only ways to improve on these questions. Question types. There are many different question types out there, but I am going to focus on the most common and ones that are most often used. So as you'll see, the second one on this list, ranking questions, is one that people come up with a lot when they want to understand how people uh, prioritize different options, but it's not something that I recommend and there are other ways of getting that information, which is why it's crossed out here. So Likert scales. Uh, on the right here, you can see examples of Likert scales and I'll just get into what they are and how they're used. So a Likert scale is ordinal, which means that the order of the options on the scale matters, but the kind of psychological attitudinal distance between those options isn't always necessarily the same, which is a bit of a mouthful. But what I mean is the difference between strongly disagree and somewhat disagree isn't necessarily the same scale as the difference between somewhat disagree and neutral or neither agree nor disagree as we tend to put it. You know, there's a little bit more room for maybe that strongly disagree is really strong and then the difference between the middle points is not as much. Likert scales are very flexible. You can put almost anything on a Likert scale and it can be used to assess attitudes, beliefs, emotions, likelihood of behavior, all kinds of things. So they're nice in that respect. People often ask how many points you should have on your Likert scale. And I've seen anywhere from three to 11, even more sometimes. Generally speaking in the literature, uh, five to seven is recommended because it allows for enough variation in people's responses that you can see differences, but not so many that they're going to get confused or find it a lot of effort to answer the question and distinguish between you know, an eight or a nine on the scale. So you'll see that in the example, I have five points and that's generally my preference, but five and seven are both very common. Should you label all the points? In the examples, you'll see that they're all labeled and often my preference is to label them. I think it helps people a little bit orient to the scale and the options, but it's also possible to just label the endpoints. So you would see strongly disagree and then you'd have a blank dot, blank dot, blank dot, strongly agree. Um, and that also works. People generally have an idea of what you're getting at when you do that, but it is a little less clear, uh, a little more ambiguous potentially. Um, and I would recommend labeling the midpoint if you have one as well. So you say neutral or neither agree nor disagree, just to keep the most important points on the scale very clear and make sure that they're not looking at them and, and not sure where the middle is. <laughs> 
There's also a difference between a symmetrical scale, like strongly agree to strongly disagree, and an asymmetrical scale from not at all to extremely, for instance. Asymmetrical means that you're giving more room psychologically to one end of the scale than the other. Uh, in terms of likelihood, if you say not at all likely to extremely likely, then there's really only one negative option, not at all likely. All the others are degrees of positive likeliness. So it really just depends on whether you're expecting almost all of the responses to be on that positive side. In that case, you might want the asymmetrical scale. But if that's not the case, then a symmetrical scale is generally easier to interpret because strongly disagree to, str to somewhat disagree is very similar to strongly agree to somewhat agree in terms of that psychological distance. And it just helps, it makes it easier to present. It's also a question of whether you want a midpoint at all. So I said five to seven is generally recommended and often that's five or seven, the odd numbers. That way there's a midpoint on the scale, but you don't always want a midpoint. If you don't want people to be able to kind of bow out of answering your question by choosing neutral, then just don't have a midpoint. It is possible to say strongly disagree, somewhat disagree, somewhat agree, strongly agree. You're forcing them to take a side. That said, people can also get annoyed by that. So. All of these, I should say, are subjective. There is no right answer to the way to do things. There are some ways that are not as optimal, but there are arguments for and against all of these different approaches. One thing I would say is use standard response options if possible. So strongly disagree to strongly agree or vice versa is a very common scale. And there's a reason for that. It's easily interpreted. It's more comparable across different surveys and different questions within a survey. And you know when you use that scale that many people have used it before. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, whereas if you're making up your own, it's easier to accidentally introduce something that's confusing to participants without even realizing it. And avoid long or frequent matrix questions. And a matrix question is the lower example on the slide right now. So you have all of your different question items there, and then you have the response options going across like a matrix. Um, it's very tempting as a researcher to ask a lot of those because it feels very streamlined and quick, but as a participant looking at a wall of questions in that format, it can be pretty daunting and it can make people drop out if there are too many of them. And finally, as we talked about before, uh, not having leading questions is very important. So you can do that with this type of question by just listing kind of both sides of a symmetrical scale by saying something like, do you agree or disagree with each of the following statements rather than just how much do you agree with each of the following statements? It's a small thing, but it's less leading if you do it that way. All right, I promised I would talk about ranking questions earlier. So oftentimes people want to know how people uh, who attended an event, for instance, found different aspects of the event, how they would prioritize different possible types of outreach that they could do, that kind of thing. Sometimes you want a ranking, but there are issues with just asking people to rank options. One of them is it can be just difficult or frustrating for participants, partially physically. Uh, drag and drop is one of the ways that survey platforms will do this and it can be difficult to do or just not work with some browsers. If you have number entry where you want them to rank the options one to five, uh, it's pretty easy for people to do that the opposite way around and you can't tell the difference. Um, and finally, even if they understand all of the physical ways of doing the ranking, it's forcing them to put options in order where they may not feel that there's a meaningful difference between them. It's also not great for analysis because the meaning of rankings is specific to the one person. Um, you know, something is only a two relative to what they chose to put first or third. Once you've averaged across all the people that you've done the survey with, uh, it might not mean very much anymore. So the bottom line here is it's better to use Likert scales instead. For instance, if you have a scale from one very low priority to seven very high priority, you can ask people to rate each option that you would have had them rank. And that way they don't have to rank things that they feel are equal. They could give them both a five, for instance. Um, but putting the averages 
from different items in order tells you the rank of them. If you average together the scores that people gave to an option, like in the example, uh, how useful was it? How useful was the communication before the event? If you average all the ratings that people gave to that particular aspect of the conference and you get a 4.4, uh, that would be higher in terms of their ranking than an option that gets a 2.7 on average. Doing this also tells you more about the distance between the options. So with a ranking, you don't know if a one versus a two is a huge gap. Maybe, maybe option one is way better than option two, but you can't tell that just by a ranking. Whereas if you have a scale one to seven, then perhaps that top option would be rated seven by many people. And then the second best is only rated around a four and a half, something like that. So it gives you a lot more information about the ranking. Next, let's look at categorical scales. So for instance, in the example, this is, what is your strongest reason for your dietary goal? A question that Phonolytics has used on a survey. And there's two different versions here. The left one just has you select one. That's why it says your strongest reason. Whereas the right-hand one has them select all that apply. And I put that in the question as well. Please select all your reasons to make sure that that's clear to people that they can select more than one option. Either of these are categorical because the order of the options is not inherently meaningful. There isn't something that's bigger than another thing or more positive and less positive. A lot of demographics are categorical. It's where you'll see this a lot. Gender, race, religion, occupation. Sometimes there's a choice between select one and select all like I talked about. And select one is definitely easier for analysis and for interpretation later. Um, sometimes a lot easier in my experience, but select all is more flexible for participants if it's hard for them to pick a top reason or uh, they have more than one job that they're trying to select from an occupation list. It's easier for them if they can select more than one. Just remember that it will be probably more difficult for you later on and so you need to weigh those different factors. When you're coming up with the list of categories to include, Make sure that if you have a hypothesis about this question, remember when you were jotting down ideas earlier, if you have any ideas about this question, how it might come out, how you expect it to come out, and alternatively, how you don't expect it to come out, but it could, you need to make sure that the response options you have are capturing all of those, both the ones that you think are likely and the ones that you think aren't, so that either way, you'll be able to find the answer. And I think I mentioned earlier, you generally want to provide an other please specify option where they can write in an answer if there's something that you didn't think of. This has definitely happened to me in the past where I asked people about the reasons for leaving a job and neglected to think about retirement as an option. I had all of these reasons to do with dissatisfaction with the work and other opportunities, but didn't think about the fact that some people just retire. And so as a result, all of those people wrote it in into the other please specify section and I was able to report it when we wrote up the, the results of the question. If I hadn't done that, then I would have just had all of these people selecting other and nothing to go on to tell me what that was. Also, if it's possible that none of the above is true of some of your participants, make sure that you include that as an option. And if you have the option with the survey platform that you're using, randomize the order of responses for each participant so that they aren't always coming in in that same order in case they're paying more attention to the ones at the top, the ones they see first. Um, just make sure that anything like none of the above obviously needs to be at the bottom and other should also be at the bottom. Open-ended questions. These are the ones where people just type in response to what you've asked. These are definitely the easiest type of question to ask because you don't have to think a lot about what people are going to say. But at the same time, they're the most likely to be skipped by participants or to cause participants to drop out of your survey entirely because they're a lot of work. This can also provide you with a lot of detail on important questions. But at the same time, it's also the hardest to analyze if you are hoping to come up with some sort of quantification of responses, the percentage of people who said X or Y. Uh, that's obviously much more difficult if you've let them write whatever they want. So generally, I recommend that you use open-ended questions sparingly, that you try to find other types if you can, 
and only use them if both of these things are true. You can't find another question type that will work, which could occur if you don't know enough about the possible answers to give options. Um, and if the question is actually important enough to warrant this amount of time from participants. So for something that's super important to your, your survey, yes, it is okay to have an open-ended question, but I would also suggest putting it toward the end of your survey so that if it does cause some annoyance or even drop out, uh, they've already put in the bulk of the work and are probably just going to hammer out that last question and hit submit so that you actually have the information as opposed to it being the first thing that they see, in which case they might just not continue. All right, let's look at an example of how you can ask the same question in different question types. Here's an example of a question that we might ask. So imagine Phonolytics had a capacity building virtual retreat. And then we want to ask this question afterward about different aspects of that retreat. So we ask it in terms of how likely people would be to recommend these different things watching live sessions, watching recorded sessions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see here we have an 11 point scale from not at all likely, zero, to extremely likely, or 10. So we've talked long enough now that you probably see some of the issues with this question, but just to go through them quickly. For the participant, this is obviously a pretty time consuming and effortful question. They have to use that 11 point scale, which is quite long, uh, to make a decision for every item on this fairly long list. So the question is, do the positives of this warrant the negatives? Obviously for the question asker, this is pretty detailed, probably pretty comprehensive, um, but does that warrant the amount of time that the participant is putting into it? And at the same time, we need to think about you later, the results interpreter, when you're looking back on this, is it easy to get something actionable out of these results? Um, you know, you can get the means from these questions quite easily, the averages uh, of what people said on average to each of these, but is that something that we can then turn into a decision or make take action over? Is this a key question for us? Um, if this is a really central key question, then maybe it warrants this level of depth with participants, but I suspect that in most cases, uh, this is probably overkill for this type of question and there are other ways you could do it. You might want to pause for a moment here and think about other ways that you could take this same question idea and ask it in a less time consuming, possibly easier to analyze way. So here are some examples of other ways of asking essentially the same question. Uh, these are the different question types that we've talked about thus far. And you can see the top left, uh, also a Likert scale, but a simplified version of one. So rather than being 11 points, this one is just five from not at all likely to extremely likely to recommend each of these things. And we've also clarified the question a little bit to say, how likely would you be to recommend each of the following to another attendee? Um, maybe not necessary, but it just helps make sure that they have the right person in mind when they're trying to answer this question for you. Then in the top right, we have a categorical scale instead. So this is pretty quick for someone to answer. If Phonolytics held another virtual retreat, which of the following would you recommend? And then they can select all of them that apply. So even though you have a pretty long list, it's just check or don't check each of the options and make sure that you have none of the above there in case that's accurate. Otherwise, if they don't check anything, you're not sure if it's because nothing applied or they just skipped the question somehow. Then you've also got a categorical scale which is select one. So in that case, you would ask what they recommend as the best feature of the retreat perhaps, and just let them select one of the things. And finally, you could do this open-ended, um, which would ask them to recommend the best features of the conference and just give them a box to type into. So as I said earlier, this is subjective. There's no right answer here. If it were me, and this is the question that we have. I think that probably I would suggest the categorical scale where they select all that apply. To me, that feels like the right level of effort and detail for this type of question, um, because it doesn't feel like a question where we need 
a large amount of detail on things as specific as watching live sessions versus recorded sessions. But if that's not the case for you and you're doing a question like this, if it matters to you a lot, uh, each of those individual items, then feel free to take something that does have more detail like the simplified Likert scale. Next, let's talk about longitudinal or repeated surveys. So first, just to distinguish those two things, a longitudinal survey is when you survey the same participants more than one time. So for instance, before and after event, um, and you can link their data from before the event to after the event. So you know whose before score goes with whose after score. A repeated survey, on the other hand, is a survey or a survey question that has been asked the same way multiple times um, in different surveys, but without the participants necessarily being the same ones or uh, being able to link the data from those different time points. You don't know that this particular response from this survey is the same person who said this in that survey. So an example of that is uh, political polling. They tend to use the same questions over and over again, but there's no implication that the participants are the same each time. For comparing across time points with either of these types of survey, you need to have consistent question wording. You also need the response options that they have to be consistent, and you need the way that the survey is administered to be consistent. So there are a few common pitfalls that I've seen. One first is tweaking a survey question that you've used before. So let's say you ran a survey last year asking about your event, and now you've run the event again, you wanna do the survey again, but you think you see a better way of asking that question. So you just tweak the wording a little bit. Well, the question to ask yourself when you do that is whether it's worth trading possibly improved accuracy for definitely being unable to directly compare those questions with last year's responses. Because once you change the wording, the way people interpret the question differs and therefore the way that they answer the question might differ. So depending on the size of the tweak, you might be able to get away with it just saying, you know, it wasn't quite the same, but it was almost identical. That could be okay. But if you change the wording substantially or you change the meaning behind the question, um, it's gonna be really difficult to compare how people saw this year's event versus last year's event. Another pitfall that I've seen is when you have this kind of a repeated survey or longitudinal survey, um, asking people to self-report a change in themselves. So for instance, if you want to know whether people are eating less meat over time, um, ask them which of these foods do you eat and include meat in there, obviously. Um, ask it to them both times. So before your event and then again after your event and then calculate the difference from one time to the other. If you're doing that within one person, that's great. Um, even if you can't and you're just comparing the average of all your participants before the event to the average after the event, that's also fine. Um, either way, do that rather than saying, did this documentary, for instance, make you eat less meat? Did our event make you eat less meat? There's a difference between self-report of something that isn't particularly loaded or uh, difficult to answer versus asking people to self-report on something that requires more reflection and more honesty and maybe overcoming some embarrassment or something like that. There's a pretty big difference in different types of self-report. So if you can, ask people to self-report as little as possible, just the behavior that they have taken and then you do the calculation for them. So here's an example of uh, where a question on a repeated survey has been changed over time and what happens. So this is a real question from US polling. Do you feel that the country in general is headed in the right direction or do you think things are seriously off on the wrong track? And then the answer choices are right direction, wrong track, neither, and unsure. If you want, you can pause here for a moment and think about how this question could be improved. So if you've watched the presentation up to this point, you're probably like me and can think of a number of ways that this question could be improved. Could it be shorter, for instance? Probably. Uh, less idiomatic, that is 
not saying things that are kind of turns of phrase, like off on the wrong track. Um, yes, it could be less idiomatic, which would make it easier for uh, people with a lower reading level or non-native speakers to understand. You probably also would rather use the same wording for your positive and negative options to avoid having a different implication to one versus the other. So right direction, wrong direction, or right track, wrong track, rather than one of each. It's a bit of an odd choice. But the question to ask is, should this question be changed? This question has been in use for literal decades. And as a result, comparability over time is the main goal at this point. We want to know whether answers have changed from now to the 70s. Um, and so as a result, this question, in spite of its flaws, which are pretty obvious, continues to be used today in some cases, but only in some cases. At the same time, there are many people who do see the ways that this question could be improved and have attempted to do so. So some polling groups have changed the wording uh, in these various attempts to improve it, and the result of that is that now there are many, many different variations on this question in use today, and it's very difficult to compare accurately across them. So here is my advice. If you are running a repeated survey or a longitudinal survey, do the best you can the first time and then leave it alone. Do it well. There's no such thing as doing it perfectly. No such thing as doing it right because every question, every way of asking a question has its flaws, its weaknesses. But just ask yourself if you your tweak, that tweak that you really want to make to improve it, is it just going to trade one flaw for another? Next, let's talk about data quality. When you're surveying mem members of the general population, uh, especially if you've recruited them online and you're paying them, uh, data quality is not always amazing. People might participate in a survey if there's an incentive just in order to get the incentive without really caring about giving good responses. So if that's the type of survey that you're looking at, um, then definitely think about data quality checks. So these are checks that are intended to catch people who are either not paying attention, um, going too quickly, or are deliberately trying to just do the survey as fast as possible in order to get that incentive. Either way, whether it's on purpose or by accident, it introduces error into your results, obviously. So all of these things, like I already touched on briefly, um, increase the necessity of having data quality checks. So offering an incentive to people, recruiting people from the general population versus within a group like an effective altruism group um, or an animal advocacy organization, that increases the chances and online data collection versus in-person data collection. All of those make it easier for someone to go through your survey quickly, anonymously, and get money for it without really caring what it's about. So if those things are all true, then you probably want to introduce some data quality checks. That said, take these carefully. So there's a lot of possible checks that you can do, but I would very rarely recommend excluding data from a participant based on failing a single check, because almost always there's some sort of extenuating circumstance you can come up with that would account for one failure. And even if the person was legitimately not paying attention for a minute and fails your check, does that mean that they should be excluded from the rest of the survey? It's not necessarily indicative of if there's just one. So a two or three strikes rule will often be your best approach. I'm not going to go over this slide in detail, but here are some different types of data quality checks that you can use and the pros and cons of each one. Hopefully they're relatively straightforward, but if you have questions, we have a link at the bottom for more information and you can always attend our office hour to ask more. The order of questions in surveys is something that you should pay some attention to as well. But it's important to bear in mind that like many of these things, there is no hard and fast answer to what is best in terms of question order. So what I'm offering today is some general guidelines for you. Important questions are best put near the beginning of your survey because near the beginning is when people are paying the most attention and answering the most carefully. Put objective questions like demographics at the end of the survey if you can because they can influence other questions if they come first, 
just by making people think about things in a certain way, but they can't be influenced by other questions very much because those answers are objective. So it doesn't really matter if you put them after other things. The one exception to that is if you need them for screening, like you're only taking women in your survey, for instance, then you need to have that gender question up front so that you can uh, say to the men who try to participate, thank you, but this is a survey on women's health issues. So you're not going to be included. If you have closed and open-ended questions on the same topic, so for instance, by closed-ended, I mean a Likert scale, categorical question, open-ended being the kind where they type in. If you have both of those on the same topic, put the open-ended question first so that you're getting their spontaneous responses uninfluenced by the option choices that you have in your closed-ended question. And if you've done all those other things and there's no other reason to have a certain order, I would just suggest having a logical flow to your questions if they have one, like there's a chronological progression or anything like that, um, just to make sure that it makes sense for participants and they can progress smoothly through it. And you may have heard of counterbalancing or randomizing question order, which counterbalancing means that you create multiple versions of your survey with the questions in different orders. Um, whereas randomizing means that the survey platform is automatically um, just doing a random order for every different participant who comes in. These aren't generally necessary a lot of the time, unless you have questions that you are pretty sure could influence each other um, in either direction. So there's no good order to put them in. Um, or if you just have a long section of really similar questions like a bunch of questions about how you feel about different plant-based products and the questions are all pretty similar, um, then it can be good to just randomize them so that if people get bored over time, it's not, they're not getting bored with the same question coming last every time. Different participants are seeing them in a different order. Finally, once you've gone through the design process and thought about all of these many issues, it's so important to review the draft that you have. So this is where we come back to those different perspectives. The first perspective that you considered when you were writing those questions was yourself as the question asker. What was important to you? What's the best way of getting the responses? And hopefully you were considering the other perspectives at the same time. But now when you review your draft is the time to put so much more emphasis on this. So I mean this literally, go through it first as the question asker and then second, but most important as a participant. Pretend you are a participant in your own survey preferably a few different participants, like picture someone in different aspects of life going through your survey and imagine how they would read and interpret the questions. So if there's something that doesn't make sense, if you're a student, then that will make sense to you now that you're going through your survey as a participant and you can catch it and fix it before it becomes an issue. Finally, go through again, thinking of it from the perspective of yourself as the results interpreter. What does it mean if we see a uh, high response of people who said that this was valuable. Is that something that we can action in some way? Uh, what does it mean if people selected that they were very happy with the event, but very dissatisfied with the speaker? Are we going to know how to interpret that? All those sorts of questions are important to consider at this point. And you might even consider in some circumstances making graphs of possible results if you have something complicated that you're trying to think through just graph out how the results might end up looking in order to think about it better. And finally, here's a checklist that can help you to review your draft from each of those three perspectives. As the question asker, are your core research questions addressed? For any research questions that, in, that require comparison to a past survey, are the questions asked the same way? For any research questions that require comparison of groups, for instance, by age, are the grouping questions included? You don't want to miss those. As the participant, have you completed your consent form checklist? Do you have a clear purpose and a time estimate? Because both of those things will increase participation rates. Have you gone through the question wording issues checklist? Are there clear questions, easy to follow, because those things will decrease attrition? What about a participant who disliked the event or the topic of the survey? Are they still likely to complete it? If they aren't, is there any way that you can increase that? 
What about a time pressed participant? How long is it? And are there any other groups of participants that you want to complete your survey but are likely to be put off by it in some way? The stated purpose, how you intend to use their data, who you're going to share it with, uh, the time commitment, or any of the other things. If there's anything you can make clearer in the consent form or change about the survey, this is the time to do that. And finally, the results interpreter perspective. So considering your research questions one at a time, what are the possible outcomes in terms of survey responses? What action will you take if you obtain each of those outcomes? And is there any ambiguous case where you get something contradictory or you otherwise wouldn't know how to interpret the result? We've covered a lot here today, and I know that many of you may still have questions, and that's okay. If you do, then you're just getting a handle on what survey design is like and all of the many questions that come up and the many subjective decisions that have to be made. So I suggest that you check out the research advice section of our website if you want to learn a bit more, or if you want to talk a little more with me or another researcher at Phonolytics, just visit our Ask a Researcher office hour, where we can talk through the kinds of questions that you have, how you want to address them, and how you can best construct a survey. Thanks for watching. I hope it's been helpful.